able to eat like that, air. and you see what happened after 45. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on air now. <laughs> you're, you're incriminating yourself. <laughs> no, you can't avoid facts. <laughs> so, um, we're going to try to do an awful lot uh, in, in a summation uh, session. One, you should have received copies of the materials from uh, the Dominican Sisters of uh, Mary Mother of the Eucharist on virtue education. Uh, we were supposed to do a video of that last night and it wasn't working in the lounge. So, but the materials are excellent. Uh, and someone said he's doing it in his school. Where you're, you're doing, yeah. Good response, it's, right? It's just, we used to do values, yeah. now we do virtues. Yeah. The, <laughs> Well, I've seen the other thing. It's typically Dominican, huh? Uh, with various schools of spirituality, you train people in the moral life by the commandments, which is usually the via negativa. Uh, whereas with this, this is the Dominican approach, which is you develop a life of virtue. And uh, and you know, it's one of the what's one of the primary accusations against Catholic moral theology? It's negative, right? Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. This is precisely the opposite. It's all based on do this. And uh, in one of the videos, it's the cutest little thing because they have the virtue of the week or the month or whatever it is. And one little kid says, he's asked, what virtue are you working on now? First grader, he says, magnanimity. <laughs> <laughs> and then he proceeds to define it as well and, uh, and give examples. And <clears throat> I'll pass these around. And if anyone wants them actually to, to uh, take them, you're welcome. Uh, they have with it a uh, Alexio Divina journal, and it's for upper school kids. Uh, and so there's a scripture passage, and then leading questions about what this passage means in C2 and what it means in application to my own Christian life. And then there's also the educator's guide to living a virtuous life, and it's called the Disciple of Christ, Education and Virtue. Yeah. Now, unlike yesterday's presentation, this is a full-on curriculum for the yes. year, yeah. as opposed to a supplemental curriculum. Yeah, and and it's well, it's supplemental in the sense that you don't spend a whole spend a whole class period on it. You know, probably. You know, what what are you people doing? Fifteen, twenty. Oh, this, oh, yeah. This is just this is just a daily little thing. Yeah. It's like you said. You do the virtue of the week, and you just kind of. But that was exactly when when your fourth grader says. Magnanimity. This is the virtue that da, 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 da. that's how you keep parents wanting to come to your school. <laughs> it, it really is. It's marvelous. I mean, it is thoroughly grounded in solid Catholic spirituality and morality, and yet using an approach that is very user friendly. Uh, and uh, and of course, another one of these things, something that's going to engage parents, because you know, the a normal parent says to a kid at you know, four o'clock. What did you learn today, huh? And the kids, today we started to work on industriousness, right? And well, and that's something then the parents can also, oh, oh, well, let's do that at home too, huh? And it, you know, we used to do values. And so we're like, okay, we just scrapped that whole values program and this just took its place. And it's like, don't bully. Like that, for me, when I hear that, it just is like, oh. I just want to punch the person. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and be a bully. Bully them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's bullying. You're bullying. Like, this actually gives them framework. Yeah. So, any other questions about that program? Yeah. So, kind of to follow up with Father Chris's question, do you still need your regular curriculum? Oh, sure. This yeah. is just uh, in the slightly. You industry. might do this at the, you know, after you do morning yeah. prayer. Right. Uh, and by the way, this week we're, we're, we're working on this, boom, boom, boom. And then, and the kids you know, go through you know, their own notation journaling system or whatever about how today I had the opportunity to exercise this particular virtue. Here's one thing that's really cool. So uh, once a month, there's a virtue that we pick and each teacher actually picks a student from their class who has been uh, demonstrating this virtue very well and then I sign these little certificates <laughs> so and so has has uh, grown been outstanding. Of, yeah, yeah. yeah been outstanding in this virtue and then after mass on that Friday when the whole school assembly is there because we don't 
have our kindergartens lower every day. Anyway, on that Friday, they come up and we're like, okay, this is great, da, 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 da. and then all the kids are just like, you know, clapping. But it makes them want to actually develop those virtues. It's a, it's a great system, it really is. All right, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we got the school choice section uh, preempted, but I don't want to leave you without dealing with it, at least in some overview. Uh, I've been dealing with this issue of uh, school choice or parental choice in education, whatever you want to call it. Uh, actually, the first term paper I ever wrote uh, as a high school student was on the Canadian system of funding uh, denominational schools. I'm going to talk about Canada in, in, in a bit. And, uh, and as I mentioned the other day, I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation at Fordham on uh, the Supreme Court and, and Catholic schools. And when we published it as a book, de-dissertationizing it somewhat, uh, it was called Constitutional Rights and Religious Prejudice. Because the roots of a, a refusal to fund denominational schools, parenthesis meaning Catholic schools, huh, is precisely rooted in the traditional American animus against the Catholic Church. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, Arthur Schlesinger says, the greatest bias in the history of the American people is anti-Catholicism. And, uh, you know, you scratch a wasp, and, you know, the most enlightened, tolerant one, after five minutes of conversation, you discover that's still right beneath the surface, all right? And uh, so that that is part of the problem, but I'll mention why it's not as much of a problem today as it was. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, what we're talking about is the opportunity for parents to exercise their rights to be the primary educators of their children. And uh, there's a constitutional principle that says a, con a constitutional right which is penalized is a constitutional right which is denied. So for example, in the, uh, in the South, before the 1960s, uh, regrettably, many Southerners thought, well, blacks are now allowed to vote, but anyone who wants to vote in this county has to pay a poll tax of $10 or $15. And it had the effect, of course, of saying, if you can't afford to pay the poll tax, you can't vote. And it was designed precisely to keep blacks from voting. Mutatis mutandis, this is what we say, every parent has a right to choose whatever educational environment he or she wishes for his child. But if you want to exercise that right, you have to pay for it. Now, in, in the 1920s, with the Know Nothing movement and the nativists and, and all of those wonderful KKKers, and again, many people forget that KKK was not formed exclusively to deal with blacks. KKK, actually in its crudest forms, is kikes, coons, and Catholics. Right? Kites meaning Jews, right? Coons, blacks, and Catholics. It's two syllables only with a K, uh, showing their tremendous erudition. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and actually, uh, the parish that I moved to as a boy from Newark to Freehold, that Father Chris loves, uh, and uh, it, I lived in essentially Catholic ghetto in Newark. I, I didn't know a non-Catholic. Uh, well, we had 14 families in our apartment building, and 13 were Catholic, and one was Episcopalian. And I said to my mother, well, what's an Episcopalian? She's, oh, they just go to Mass in English. And, uh, and at the time, that probably was the only big difference. A lot has changed. At any rate, we moved to, uh, to Freehold, uh, and from this massive parish here with seven priests and 30 nuns in Newark, we go to this little hamlet of Freehold, and there are two priests, and there are, the school is double grades, so sixth and seventh in the same classroom and so forth. And, uh, and it was a Methodist stronghold. And uh, we moved in on Labor Day weekend, and uh, we went to Mass, and it was kind of rather amusing than that very far, too, because I had been an altar boy already for four or five years. And I said, well, let's, I couldn't serve, obviously, the first week in a new parish. So I said, let's sit in the front pew. And so the priest comes out, he starts mass, and we start giving all the responses. And all the people around us are looking at what's going on here. And uh, of course, in, the, in Newark, it was a very liturgical parish, I never attended a mass without full congregational participation. 
and hadn't reached the country yet. And at the end of Mass, the pastor or the celebrant, is he passed? He said, <laughs> We went, he said, Are you city folk? <laughs> he said, We're not there yet with giving these responses at Mass. And uh, at any rate, he came the Tuesday after Labor Day, and I'm coming down the steps of our house, and there's an old lady sitting across the street on a rocking chair with a shotgun. <laughs> she looked like <laughs> Mammy Yoakum. And, uh, Pistol pack and mom. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I come out in my little Catholic school uniform. I'm walking down the, the stairs, and I hear her yell to the, her next-door neighbor, Oh, my God, Mabel, they're Catholics. <laughs> and for the next three years, nobody spoke to us. I guess we were lucky <laughs> because they could have done worse. So it was too humble. But that was in 1964. What state was that? New Jersey. The KKK was active in Central and South Jersey through the 50s and 60s against Catholics. In fact, they tried to kill the Catholic pastor of Freehold. In, <laughs> no, this is not funny. This is the reality, right? <laughs> in, in, in 1950. <laughs> In, in 1950, they tried to kill him. They called him out on a sick call in the middle of the night and uh, and, and tried to do to, to, to a violence to him. So, so, I mean, this is all, I mean, you know, this is in my lifetime this was going on. Uh, so at any rate, that's the background for the whole problem with funding of Catholic schools. Now, when we have to be careful that the language we use has to be very precise when we're talking about this. And this is an education of our people first. When I worked for the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights in the 80s, I would give these workshops because it was the beginning of the Reagan era and he was very open to all kinds of school choice options. And I would go around and give parental workshops on this issue and, uh, and explain you know, what the constitutional issues are, what the public policy issues are, and how people ought to be fighting the battle. The first question in the question and answer period, a parent would get up and say, but father, but father, you know, we choose to use at the Catholic school. That's our, we have to pay for it. We choose that. And I said, you know, you're so conditioned to be second class citizens. You don't even realize. I said, that's like a black saying, I'm black. My grandmother was a slave. Why, why should I be anything different? All right. So first of all, an education of our own people. And I used to love to quote John the 23rd from uh, Mater Magistra, where he says, you can't validate the rights of others unless you vindicate your own first. All right. And so if we're willing to be second class citizens, well, you know, that's, that's shame on us. Uh, but when we were talking about these issues in the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s, the Catholic anti-Catholic animus was very easy to ignite because 90% of so-called private schools, which drives me nuts, uh, private schools were Catholic. And so you didn't have to say I'm against Catholic schools. You said, I'm against elite private schools, albeit the fact that in the inner city, 80% <laughs> of the kids in the Catholic schools are not even Catholic, right? Uh, so we had to decide to change the terms of the conversation. So that we're not talking about aiding the church, huh? but we're talking about aiding parents. And again, that is no longer a specifically Catholic issue. It's kind of interesting if you look at the history of the anti-position. The Southern Baptist Convention for a hundred years had resolutions every year against what they called parochiate. Is it even the language? Because what's it sound like? Medicaid, yeah, it's government stuff, all right? money going to these people. And, uh, and, and, they, and through the very high ground of the First Amendment, separation of church and state, although, of course, the, the expression separation of church and state does not exist in any constitutional document. Right? That's in a private letter of Thomas Jefferson to the Baptist uh, Federation. They wanted him to declare, declare a day of fasting, uh, praying fasting. And he said, that's not my business, all right? At any rate, since Baptists who controlled the public schools in, in the Deep South, those were their schools, all right? <laughs> and so that's why they didn't care about any kind of government aid. But since they've become disenchanted with the government schools and have started their own schools, it's amazing they've had a much more enlightened concept of separation of church and state. Now they're in favor, <laughs> all right, of all the stuff that we were fighting for alone. <clears throat> 
uh, my mother, who was often very cutting edge with a lot of this stuff, probably about <clears throat> 1959 or 60, said to the pastor at St. Rose's in Newark, as I told you, one out of every two kids in New Jersey was in a Catholic school in those days. And my mother said, Monsignor, we need to get the, some money from the government. Yeah, yeah we should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, I think what we ought to do <clears throat> is for one week, close all the Catholic schools in the state of New Jersey and send them all to the public school. And the pastor said, oh, Mrs. Stravinskis, we would never want people to think that we're not good citizens. So what is this? Once again, the immigrant mentality, right here. <sighs> let it go, let it go. And my mother said, well, it's easy for you to say, you don't have any kids. <laughs> uh, but she was you know, way ahead of the curve on, on all of that stuff. At any rate, <clears throat> the point that we need to make in any of these aid programs, whether that's vouchers, tuition tax credits, any of it, is that we don't want a single penny to go to the church or the school, not a penny. We want the money to go to parents <clears throat> for two reasons. First of all, because it underscores the fundamental philosophical and constitutional issue that parents are the primary educators of their children. And number two, we don't want a penny to come to us for the simple reason that he who pays the piper calls the tune. And this is the problem that they're facing in England and Increasingly, it's going to be the case in all these countries that have had this kind of aid. <clears throat> I gave a talk at an international conference in Barcelona a couple of years ago, and I said, you Europeans, many of you are living in a fool's paradise, but you better start preparing now to establish your own independent school system, because the day is going to come sooner rather than later when you're going to be told, if you don't teach this, there's no money, and then you're not going to be prepared. You're not going to know what to do at that point. So... What we have suffered as American Catholics for 200 years, uh, we have some good advice to give to the elder churches in, in Europe about how they ought to be behaving at this point. Uh, and, and what's the principle involved or the practical aspect of this with, let's say, a voucher? Uh, I give, the government gives Mrs. Smith a voucher for $5,000. She can use it at any school of her choice. It's no different from Mrs. Jones, who's on welfare, getting food stamps. She gets the card with the food stamp money. She can go to ShopRite. She can go to Acme. She can go to Grossinger. Any, and the government doesn't tell the supermarkets how to operate, except for the minimal standards of, of cleanliness and, and so forth. Right? And it would be exactly the same here. Now, <clears throat> there are several states now that have moved in this direction. Indiana has a very successful... Uh, voucher program. Florida has something less, but also worthwhile. Pennsylvania has something that's kind of convoluted. It's hard to get all the particulars of it, but uh, it's the uh, the businesses can designate uh, money for a charity, and, and a school can apply to be one of those legitimate businesses that then gets the, the, the money. Uh, so there are creative things. Certainly, uh, the Trump administration, including Betsy DeVos, the head of the um, education bureaucracy uh, for the country, she's completely in favor of this. Uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, the so-called four conservative Catholic judges on the court right now are all in favor of it. Kavanaugh has written opinions at lower case levels in favor of it. So if this came at a national level, which would be the way to avoid See, because some of the states have what they call Blaine amendments. Someone mentioned, one of the speakers mentioned, Senator Blaine was a bigot in New York State who invented a, a, a law that said you can't give money to sectarian schools. Whenever you hear that word sectarian, that's a nasty word, all right? It, it means some weird group, right? And, uh, and many of the states, under the influence of the know-nothings and the nativists, adopted those into their state constitutions so that even if I were to present a plan in New York, for example, they have a Blaine Amendment. And so you can't do something there precisely because of that. So you got to get rid of the Blaine Amendment. The only way to get rid of it nationally is to bring a court case against New York State. Right? Then the Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional and then the door is open for everything else. 
So there's a process that's going to be engaged, but it's very important. Um, and interestingly, by the way, in, in the 1920s in the state of Oregon, uh, a law was passed out mandating that every child in the state had to go to a public school. Hmm. Now, what was the purpose of it? It was to close down the Catholic schools of Oregon. And there's a very famous Supreme Court case, Pierce versus the Society of Sisters, 1925. The Society of Sisters are the Sisters of the Holy Names of Jesus and Mary, completely shot order now. But at the time, they had a very clever lawyer who brought the case to the Supreme Court, not on the basis of, of religious freedom, but on the basis that their right to engage in business was being impeded. And the Supreme Court sided with them, but went far beyond that very narrow issue. And among other things said, a child is not a, a, a ward of the state, but the parent. Da, da, da. And it's the only Supreme Court decision that's quoted in a papal document. It's quoted in the encyclical of Pius XI in Divini Elias Magistri. Uh, so it's, it, it's a very, very critical Supreme Court decision. And of course, then enshrined. And it finds its way incorporated also into the uh, social, the compendium of the social doctrine of the church. But that is the principle that's involved. Uh, our point needs to be also that Catholic schools serve a civic function and do it very well. Right? Uh, and furthermore, that the existence of our schools, even in our weakened state, huh, uh, save taxpayers millions upon millions of dollars. When then Bishop Bevilacqua <clears throat> was the auxiliary of Brooklyn, he insisted that in front of every Catholic school there be a sign that says, this school saves you, the taxpayer, X million dollars. And so they would cost out. We have, we have 300 kids in the school. It's normally costing 15,000 a kid. Da, da, da. And if this child were in the public system, you would be added to your tax bill just from this one school alone, $450,000 a year. Uh, that's kind of a, a wake up call to bigots, all right? <laughs> and everybody will vote ultimately with his pocketbook. I think that's why Trump is going to do well in, in his second term, because people are going to say, we're better off financially. <laughs> Whatever his tweets are, we feel a lot more comfortable. Um, now, some caveats. Huh? Uh, be careful of outside control. <clears throat> there, there are some programs in New York uh, where various corporations are contributing to the maintenance of particularly inner city schools. And uh, the New York Times interviewed the superintendent of schools uh, for the archdiocese and said, are you concerned uh, that there might be attempts to control? Well, he said, well, of course, someone who pays is gonna have something to say. That's a horrible statement, all right? <laughs> yeah, I don't want the money then if there's strings attached. Now the archdiocese of Philadelphia has a wonderful program called the, uh, in, the Independence uh, Mission Schools. Uh, these are inner city schools that were on the verge of closing. And the archbishop essentially said, you know, we can't afford it anymore. And again, 80% of the kids, not Catholic. And, uh, but a bunch of businessmen got together and said, this is something worth saving. And uh, these schools have this lay board that is responsible for finance, but in terms of Catholic identity and curriculum, that is still all completely within the realm of the church. And I have visited several of these schools. What's fascinating about it, as I mentioned to you, the past couple of years, I've been doing some student teaching things for Grand Canyon University. When I went to one of these inner city public schools, it was unbelievable. I mean, I just couldn't imagine the, the horror of the whole situation. In five minutes, I felt like I was in a jungle, uh, screaming, cursing, this is little kids, right? And, uh, and at the end of my first visit, and all, all of the kids in the school are black, all of the teachers, all the administrators, and one of the young uh, male teachers saw me leaving and he said, quite an experience, Padre, isn't it? Ironically, two blocks away, there is a Catholic school, exactly the same demographic, peaceful, calm. Almost every kid in the eighth grade gets a scholarship to a Catholic diocesan high school. Totally different universe, but why? We're doing something that's exponentially different, all right? And people all know that. And that's why when you want to talk about inner city Catholic education, 
even the bigots have to admit we're doing something that nobody else is able to do. And of course, we're doing it as that study from the University of Santa Clara of, uh, of uh, California says, precisely because of the role of uh, the role of religion in there. Uh, and uh, so that's all I want to say. Is that my plenty more could be said. Uh, but any questions about it or uh, anything in your particular locale that uh, uh, that uh, is pertinent? Yeah. Are you aware of any um, <clears throat> any way any formulas for determining financial aid in our situation? It's the diocese that determines it, but it's through FAFSA. They have to go, um, which I don't think is a very fair assessment of uh, of someone's need. Well, see, you know, when you try to find something objective, and you have to, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, the people who suffer most with Catholic school tuition are not the rich or the poor, right? Uh, it's the middle class that gets shafted. Mm -hmm. And so daddy makes $150,000 a year. Well, that, that sounds pretty darn good, all right? But when you've got three or four kids, huh, and your mortgage is you know, 2500 3000 a month, uh, and, and if you really want you know, a stay-at-home mom, uh, 150, or if mom works part time, now it's up to maybe 200. And you say, gee, I'll pay for these people look awfully good. And but it's not taking into consideration these other things. One of the things that I used to do, both as a pastor and an administrator, school administrator, we had what we called negotiated tuition. And so you would say to the school community, parents, uh, it costs us. $12,000 to educate your child. Uh, how much of that can you pay? And now we have to do this in an honest way, and you know, to use the current word, discernment process and accompaniment, all right? Uh, and, and so I'm a, a hard nosed administrator. So, so bring in your tax forms, all right? Let's, let's have a conversation about this. Uh, and the interesting thing is, <clears throat> We would say, all right, the tuition is six thousand dollars. To the poor people, how much of that can you pay? That's a two thousand. Okay, fine. I've never understood the stupidity of pastors and principals who have empty seats in their classes huh, and won't take someone who can't afford the full tuition. You're not paying for any more electricity. All right, you're not paying for more another teacher. Okay? Fill the classroom. All right, and it's two thousand dollars more than you had. Uh, but then you say to a wealthy person, it costs, <clears throat> we're charging 6000 for tuition. Uh, how much more can you pay than that? Now, see, if he pays the 6000 and for our friends from other countries, huh, uh, tuition is not tax deductible uh, because it's a commodity that you're purchasing. Right? So the rich person says, well, certainly I can pay the 6000 And how much more can you pay than that? I could pay another 5000 which is tax deductible. <laughs> and uh, so you can serve the poor by allowing the rich to be generous, all right? And, uh, and it works rather well. I mean, and, and most people, I mean, they're, they're not dishonest about it. And uh, they say, yeah, I, I can do that. And, uh, and I, I think it's a, it's a winning formula. Anything else on the... Either the government aid thing, but as I said, be extraordinarily careful about what kind of program. And when you hear, well, I'll give you another example. Back in 98, I guess, I was invited to give a workshop to the administrators of the newly reopened Catholic schools in Lithuania. And uh, it was actually a, a, one of the most marvelous experiences of my life. And... Uh, but I heard that they had legislation in the, in the hopper to give government aid to the Catholic schools. And, and I met with the auxiliary bishop, and I said, how does this work? And, I, and what, you know, what's the government involvement in the whole thing? And he said, well, he said, I think it's very good. Um, the government, uh, I said, well, who, who appoints faculty? Who appoints administrators? And he said, well, I guess they're equivalent of a county. There's a county education supervisor for the state. And uh, we can propose three candidates for a, a principal, like a turnover for a bishop. 
And, uh, and I said, and, uh, and he said, they can pick one. I said, can they reject all three? And he said, yeah. I said, then what? And he said, well, then we have to present another turnip. I said, suppose he rejects all of those. And he said, well, then he chooses one. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, Bishop, do you understand? And they kind of start to cry. And he said, we, we don't understand these things. We don't know. I said, I said, yeah, we've been in this for a long time in America. Let me tell you, don't do it. And from there, I was going to Rome. And among other meetings I had was with Cardinal Laghi, who, of course, had been our nuncio and then was in charge of Catholic education. And he said, I heard you were in Lithuania. I said, yes. He said, I'm going there next week to dedicate a seminary. And he said, what were your experiences? I told him about all the positive stuff. And then I said, but, and he said, what? And I told him about this plan. And he said, you are kidding. He said, where's the nuncio? Where's the nuncio? Right? Well, obviously, as a diplomat should have known, this is a disaster. And the lucky was always right on top of thing. He said to the secretary, get Monsignor so-and-so on the phone. And it was torpedoed by the Holy See, okay? <laughs> and uh, before Lagi ever got there. And so be very, very careful about these, these arrangements because they may sound intriguing, and particularly when you're strapped financially, you say, oh, well, any port in a storm. Well, <laughs> you can get shipwrecked in. So anything else on that? <clears throat> okay, then some of the materials... <laughs> All right, this is a, another piece from Crisis on the internet, blessing or curse. All right, I think we've talked plenty about it, but I'm giving you some things also that you may well be familiar with, but that these are items that you may want to share with parents or faculty. Huh? And, and sometimes it's the faculty issue too that you know, some of these people have a very uncritical approach to things, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, it, it helps kids do this. Well, okay, but there are side effects as well. Uh, <clears throat> and this is an article by Sister Thomas Moore uh, Stepanovsky, who is a uh, national Dominican. I think it's um, and the article is called "Loss of Memory and the Persistence of Beauty." One of the shibboleths of uh, the modern educators in the 60s and 70s was rote memorization is absurd, it's bad pedagogy, etc. Right? And one of the things that the so called religious educators of the 70s were saying, oh, you know, in those bad old days, the kids memorized the catechism, cautious. they had no idea what it was, they just regurgitated the answers and so forth. Well, let me assure you that that was, first of all, not the case, all right? Uh, did we have to memorize? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to make the case for that in a moment. But, so, um, the standard question, who made you? God made you. Why did God make me? And sister would say, okay, God made me to know him, to love him, to serve him. This world be happy with him forever in heaven. All right, now, boys and girls, let's dissect this. This is second grade, right? God is supreme. God is the being. What's a being? She put the word being on the board. Supreme, what does supreme mean? She would dissect every single word in the sentence and then say, now let's put it all back together again, right? And now go home and memorize that tonight. A couple of years ago, I was on the uh, on the line here for a re-registration of a car. You haven't lived through it, you've done this in New Jersey. And, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's a foretaste, not a purgatory, but hell. <laughs> and so I'm standing on the line and you know, you get a ticket like you're at a supermarket, and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And uh, and so the woman viewing out the tickets, she kind of whispered to me, she said, Father, I'd love to push you ahead, but you know, some of these people here, and I said, No, oh, don't worry, that's fine. So we ended up talking. And she said, Yeah, I'm a Catholic school girl. And uh, I said, and and she said, mm, great experience, great, great. And my kids went, and she said, the only thing I didn't like about Catholic school was memorizing that Baltimore Catechism. Boy, I hated it. And I said, oh, okay. So we went on a bit, and I said, um, by the way, what's a sacrament? Out of the blue, she said, a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. I said, who made you? God made me. Why did God make me? Oh, well, she was 50 years old, right? And I said, you see that? 
I said, you own that, right? No one will ever be able to take that away from you. Huh? And she said, oh. Now there's a wonderful, one of the great schools in the Archdiocese of Miami, <coughs> uh, a little, in Little Flower Parish, which has the wonderful Carmelite nuns from Alhambra. They have 900 kids in the school uh, with four or five wonderful sisters. And I was doing a workshop for the faculty, but I got there a day and so I visited the school and, and the principals, the pastor said, be sure to go to the junior high religion classes. We have a layman and a sister that are dynamite. They're absolutely fantastic. So I went into uh, the sixth grade, one of the sixth grade, I think, three or four of each grade. And I went in and uh, the layman was there, who I think is a Stubby product. And, uh, and they were studying and they had just begun the sacrament of matrimony. And so I said, well, tell me about it. It's the kids, you know, they, I said, well, let's go back to what's a sacrament? And it was the deer in the headlights. And the kid said, well, it's a religious ceremony. I said, oh, is benediction a sacrament? Which they have every week. Right? Yeah. No, no. And I said, uh, what about Vespers? Because the parish does that. And he, no, no, that's not a sacrament. I said, well, what's a sacrament? And so then I gave them the traditional definition. I said, now write it down. And we went through the same process. And when the teacher walked me out, he said, Father, I'm mortified. He said, I said, that's why you have to teach kids things, handy little things to memorize. Huh? And uh, you know, my whole education was, was, ed, uh, was memorization, all the way through to college even. Huh? And uh, you know, we had to memorize the, uh, the uh, multiplication tables. I find out now, by the way, that in the public schools, the kids don't memorize the multiplication. They don't know them. They use the calculator, right? What if the battery goes dead, right? You know, you're, you're finished, right? Because the battery up here has never been on. So. Uh, or in, in high school, every year we'd have you know, a Shakespeare play in English, and we had to memorize one of the soliloquies. And so first year, freshman year, was the Merchant of Venice, Portia's soliloquy. The quality of mercy is not strained. It dropped with his gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. But I, I learned that in 1964. Right? I can still do it. Uh, sophomore year, we had to memorize the entire hound of heaven. Right? Fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my mind. Kids lucky to huh? Until cell phones, I prided myself on knowing every area code in the United States. And, uh, and I probably had committed to memory 200 telephone numbers. I don't think I know three right now. I was in panic mode when I got a new phone. The nitwit who made the transition didn't transfer all the data. I lost 100 phone numbers. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know who they are at this point. Right? But it shows how paralyzed we are. Huh? But, and what does the memory do? Not simply gives us data at hand at any time, but it gives us something to fall back on. Huh? And so that woman at the car registration, huh? Uh, if someone did ask her a question, she could go through that and then, then share that with somebody else. And then sister talks about the, the importance of memory. And again, and of course, here's the other interesting thing. Huh? What is our central act of worship? It's anamnesis, right? It's memory, sacred memory. Huh? And But what do we have instead? We have amnesia, not am, anamnesis. Right? And that does a pseudo-Catholic well. And of course, then has all kinds of other implications. I memorize something because it means it's something worth keeping in memory. If I don't memorize it, it means it really is ephemeral. And then the whole concept of beauty. Well, you know, when, if you were you know, raised in the, in the 70s, there was the era of the ugly. I mean, that's all. And the uglier, the better, because that proved that you were really modern. Um, then uh, Archbishop Chapu has a column in uh, Catholic Philly every week, and he's been doing something interesting in the lead up to this Synod on the Youth, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> and, uh, which is orchestrated by, you know, old codger uh, Italian prelates uh, who think they have a, a, a market on the whole thing. 
At any rate, Chaput has been doing something interesting for the past couple of months. He's given over his column to youth because he did a consultation of youth in the archdiocese. Huh? And this one is written by a young fellow who has just completed his senior year at Notre Dame, but is a product of Bishop Shanahan High School, which high school, by the way, has consistently produced the most priests for the archdiocese. How many guys in your time? When I was in St. Charles and Phil, there must have been five or six. Right. From one high school. From, that one. from one high school, right? And, uh, and, and the fellow, I mean, gosh, first of all, he writes beautifully, right? <laughs> he could be telling you, go to hell, you want to take the trip, right? Uh, but the depth of the theological understanding of things and what he thinks is important to be discussed at the Synod. So Chapu has this little folder full of what real youth are talking about, all right? And this is very, very well worthwhile. And then this is information on the um, the stewardship program from the Diocese of Wichita. And, and once again, you don't have to wait for someone with a pointed hat to establish a program. All right, do it. All right, you can do this at your own parochial level. And and as Mario said this morning, stewardship is uh, it's a mode of discipleship. All right. So it's not simply a stopgap measure to do this. Yeah, no, no. It's, it's a whole mentality. And, and what I never understand is uh, Catholic giving in the United States is an embarrassment. Right? Uh, when I was a kid at that parish in Freehold, the, it was interesting. The parish had its 110th anniversary when I was in seventh grade, and we were only on our second pastor. The founding pastor was 60 years. The incumbent was 50. And he died when I was in eighth grade. And from 64 to the present, there have been 12 pastors. So 110 years, two. <laughs> 50 plus years, 12. It's a sign of, of the instability in, in, the, in the modern church. Uh, but at any rate, old Monsignor Cooker had you know, great <laughs> little pastoral things. And, and one year he said, uh, you'll notice when you come to Mass on Christmas, this is the fourth Sunday of Advent, we're having new collection plates we bought, and they're tin. And he said, and in keeping with the Knights of Columbus program to keep Christ in Christmas, I don't want to hear jingle bells, I want to hear Silent Night. <laughs> and then he would weigh the collection every week. And say, the collection was 52 pounds. Let's get the weight down, get the weight down. <laughs> and then his ultimate was, Catholics are for the birds. Cheap, cheap, cheap. And it's true. I mean, the percentage of giving for Catholics is what something like 1.2%, right? And then you've got, you know, the evangelicals, you know, they pride themselves on their, their tithing. And of course, the Jews, I mean, they really know how to do it. First of all, that's beneath the dignity of the rabbi. Right? Nothing to do with it. He just collects his 150. Right? That's the job of the president of the synagogue. They have an annual meeting, presided over. The rabbi's not even there. Studying Torah. The president of the synagogue says, So, Mrs. Goldstein, could you tell us how much you're going to contribute this year? $500. Uh, Mr. Schreiber, how much? $750. That keeps going around. Right? And of course, you notice what's happening. And he comes back. Now, Mrs. Goldstein, that you see your congregants are so generous, you want to change your contribution. Number one. Number two. No ticky, no shorty, shorty. If you haven't paid your dues, nothing from the synagogue or the rabbi. You could drop dead on the front lawn of the synagogue, nothing. Okay. I'm not saying we do that, but but it's an understanding that you know, we don't survive on plenary indulgences, right? <laughs> uh, and it's your responsibility as lay people to support this. Right? Uh, What's that? Like for legal contract. You can actually won in court. Oh, yeah. They, they, they sue people and they've got the contract because it's considered. Oh, sure. Sure. In, in any state? <laughs> now, by the in way. North Carolina, it's a state law. Yeah. If somebody makes a pledge. Yeah. Well, and he, here's something else that I suggest in terms of school funding. 
And it's the concept of this Wichita thing, but applied locally. You enter into a contract with every new parishioner family. And you say, <clears throat> to be a full-fledged member of this parish, you must be a tithing contributor. Uh, you must go to Sunday Mass. You must do this. You must do that. In return for which you are entitled to the full ministrations of this parish, which include the sacramental life, counseling, spiritual direction, and the Catholic education of your children. And so whatever contribution they're making is not to the school. It's to the parish, which is a tax-exempt entity, and therefore, effectively, their tuition money is being written off. But, you know, our Lord says his disciples are supposed to be what? As what? Shrewd. Yeah. And except <laughs> what really is, the children of this age are wiser than the children of light. Uh, this is a, an article on, I, I've talked about this briefly, a tale of two kinds of bioethics education. And what uh, John Berger is talking about here is this whole question about uh, how do we teach science in a Catholic school versus how it's taught in, in the secular system. Uh, and which, by the way, let's make the note, it's not taught from a point of view of neutrality, okay? And, and, and by the way, you know, Father's talking about values education. There's no such thing as value neutrality. Right? Not saying something about something is saying something about it. Right? Uh, and then this is from, from the New York Times, of all things. Even a stop clock is right twice a day. Uh, and the Times has this article entitled, Guess Who's Taking Remedial Classes? And this dispels the myth of the marvelous public schools in suburbia. Hopeless, hopeless, described by the New York Times, all right? And what colleges are saying. By the way, two weeks ago, there was an article in the Times. I read it every day for penance, even outside of London. Uh, but you have to know what the enemy is saying. Uh, but they have an article about college honors. Would any of you hazard a guess as to what percentage of Harvard graduates this year received manya or summa cum laude diplomas? 62%. And what does that mean? It's not really much. Of Great money. inflation, all right? It's a joke. It's an absolute joke, all right? And they went through all the other Ivy League places. Princeton, I think, was 48%. And, you know, unbelievable. Well, I remember having a girl at this community college a couple of years ago, and they keep their grades online. And, and actually, I do something with them that I did with my high school students regularly. I tell them, would you please tell me what your grade is? And I just write it down. But high school kids hated this because they would like to say that, yeah. One kid said to me, well, you know, you're making me, I said, I'm telling you, I'm not giving you a grade. So it's not that Father Peter was in a rotten mood today and so chose to give you a D, give you a D, or he was in a great mood, so he got an A. I said, I'm just like God. I just read the book. You, know, you tell me. I, you have told me this is what you do. But so this girl said, I said, well, what's your grade? And she said, well, online it says... Is there any other line that we're looking at? Yeah. And she said, well, it's a, a C. And I said, that's it. I said, you know, I said, uh, Jesus could multiply loaves and fish. I can change bread and wine into his body and blood, but I can't change your grace. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the secular setting. Huh? And she said, but, 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 uh, I mean, that will destroy my GPA. I said, so yeah, I said, you still have four weeks to do something about it. <laughs> And she said, and so, in the end, I just read this, and she said, well, and you, you can't change it? And I said, I don't know how much Latin or scripture you know. I said, the quote, scripsy, scripsy, what I've written, I've written. That's <laughs> no going back from it. But this is the whole problem. This is the, the great inflation. The, and in one of the high schools, the one I have on Staten Island, there are 11 Catholic high schools on Staten Island. And my luck, I get the dump of them. 
and get the, the ecclesiastical policy of how to fix it. No spirituality, no academic standards, terrible discipline. And of the 11, we had the largest percentage of kids coming to us from public junior highs, 62% of the freshman class from public school. Can you imagine attempting to integrate ninth graders into a Catholic ethos after nine years of life in a jungle? Right? No discipline, no academic standards, no respect for teachers or each other. Right? And we're supposed to do something with these people and, and make them civilized in, in four years. Grace builds on nature. It's it's so gone by that point. At any rate, we would get parents coming in and moaning and groaning. And my first semester, first quarter there, I think I was probably teaching I don't know, English or French or something or other. And you know, the first parent night, of course, the first parent night, isn't that the most wonderful night of the year? All mysteries are solved, right? <laughs> the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? <laughs> the veils are removed, right? <laughs> And so I look outside my office door, and there's a procession of mamas. <laughs> and the first one comes in, chomping on gum with the Brooklyn accent. Well, you know, my father, I've got to tell you, like, I'm really upset with my daughter's grade. And I said, uh, and what, what's the upset? Well, like, you know, um, I mean, like, you gave her a D, and she deserved, I said, and she deserved an F. I said, now let me ask you a question. If I had given your daughter an A, although she knows no English, right? If I had given her an A, would you be online complaining that she doesn't know English? Or are you simply online complaining because she got a bad grade and you really don't give it to him whether she knows the subject or not? Uh, what, uh, I said, bye now. <laughs> Next one comes in. <laughs> And she said, gave her the same answer. She said, I want you to understand something. We had a, a professor like you at PS42, and we got rid of him real quick. <laughs> I said, well, I got to do this for you, sweetheart. We're getting rid of your door. <laughs> <laughs> I said, the inmates don't run the asylum. <laughs> okay? She goes out in the hall, and she looks at the line of 42 mamas. And she said, forget about it. He's a nut. <laughs> and they all went. <laughs> it was the end of the story. <laughs> so, I mean, there are things that we can do, all right? And, 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 that, and the word goes out. See, that's the other thing. Give yourself a reputation for being an SOB, and you never have to prove it. I'll go there. It really is true. <laughs> Summarizes Mark Bauerlein's book that, that he didn't talk about last night uh, <laughs> on the uh, dumbest generation. Uh, and then this whole thing about the transgender business. And Father Ryan, you were the one who talked about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're going to have to you know, know how to deal with all this stuff. The other issue I should weigh in on at the moment is what to do with the children of same-sex couples, all right? There was a famous episode that occurred in California a couple of years ago, in the land of fruits and nuts. And uh, they had, uh, <laughs> are you taking down notes from what to say? Oh, yeah, you? I did. <laughs> They had uh, the Norbertines, you probably know, you know, St. Michael's Abbey. And, and by the way, if you want to see a magnificent boys prep school, oh my gosh, phenomenal, right? And, and by the way, from which they regularly get the, the men for their own community. Um, but the Norbertines are also involved in a parish that Father James was in. Uh, and uh, in uh, uh, San Pedro, and uh, and they have one of their own parishes as well. And it was in their own parish that a couple, two men, went to the school to register, quote, their son, uh, for, for school. 
And the principal kind of panicked and she delayed them and said, oh, could you sit here for a minute? And, and so she called the pastor <laughs> and she said, well, here's our, you know, this is the first time this is happening. What do we do? And he said, I'll come over and let's have a conversation with them. And so the pastor was being very pastoral and he accompanied them and helped them discern that, yes, we are not going to, well, we do not approve of your lifestyle, but we don't want to punish your child either. So here's the deal. <clears throat> Understand that in our classes, when it's the appropriate moment, we're going to be teaching children that marriage according to natural law and God's plans is a man and a woman, number one. <clears throat> uh, number two, uh, we're happy to, again, to have your son. You can come to any school events. However, you're never to identify yourselves as husband and husband, and there can be no public displays of affection. And it lasted for about a couple of years. And then there was a, I don't know, a Christmas pageant or something or other, and they must have been under the, uh, the uh, mistletoe. And, uh, and at a certain moment, the two guys kissed at this school event. And parents went wild, absolutely wild. And so the pastor and the principal said, yeah, little Tommy has to go. You're punishing our child. No, 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 no. You are punishing your child. You agreed to something and you've not been met of your word. And so it's unfortunate, it's sad that your boy has to suffer, uh, but that's the way it has to be. And, and I think that's, and as I indicated, you know, the first night, I'm very cautious about setting a bar too high for parents, lest children suffer. I mean, again, if that nun in 1955 had said to my mother, you're not married to the church, hell with you and your kid i would not be a catholic and i wouldn't be a priest right uh, so i'm sensitive to that issue but at the same time you know we have to be careful that you know the ethos of the school has to be what it is and we have to be honest right and uh, and so yeah we can do this but let's make sure we all understand what we're all about you know? any other questions on that because yeah um, would something like that such an agreement uh, have to be in writing oh i, I, I would do it absolutely yeah. Because again, in our litigious society, <laughs> if it ain't in writing, it doesn't exist. But then we have to do it across the board, so so that the, the, that couple wouldn't uh, sue you that, that you're picking out on or picking them. To well, I would say to them very simply, uh, we're going to do this with you because you're the only one, only one it applies to at the moment. Now, because you know, we can all now many dioceses have what they call covenants with parents, and so. I agree to the following things, to go to Mass every Sunday, to observe the laws of the church on marriage, et cetera, et cetera. It can be included in a, in a document like that. There was an episode that happened in, in this diocese uh, a year and a half ago, and, and, and the two Newark priests will know about this. What was it? Was it at St. Philomena's uh, with the, the girl on the boys' basketball team? Oh, no, St. Uh, Teresa's. St. Teresa's, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and this actually made national news, huh? And uh, the uh, they didn't have enough girls to man uh, a fourth grade basketball team, and so one of the one of the fourth grade girls said, "Well, I want to play basketball," and so she started to complain about getting onto the boys' team. <clears throat> and the uh, the school principal, a Salesian sister, uh, uh, said, "No." Well, a boys basketball team, not a girls team. And uh, and so the parents went to the pastor and the pastor said, well, the sister makes these decisions and I support her. And so the parents went the civil route and I don't know how this happened, but they got a court judgment forcing the school to put the girl on the boys team. And so she played for that season and it came toward the end of the academic year and it was time to re-register children. And when that came, the principal said that we're sorry that we cannot accept your girls back for next year. Well, why not? Well, because first of all, you violated your contract with the archdiocese, whereby you promised never to sue the church or the school or the parish. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> so you violated the contract. And, well, 
Of course, we can't take no for an answer, so we go back to court. And they go back to court, and there's a hearing. And uh, who was subpoenaed to testify but the archbishop? And people were holding their breath, thinking, hey, what's he going to say? What's the result of this going to be? And the first item on the local news, 10 o'clock, all the New York channels, was the, lot, the clip of Cardinal Tobin's testimony. And he began by saying, you know, there's nobody who's more concerned about every Catholic child being in a Catholic school than I. I'm one of 13 children, all of whom went to Catholic school. My whole life has been in Catholic education, blah, blah, blah. He said, however, these two girls unfortunately cannot return to St. Teresa's school, not because of the school principal or the pastor, but because of their parents who have created such turmoil in the parish community and in the school community that it would be impossible to carry on the educational mission of the school if those two children were there. And the judge said, well, first of all, I don't know how this case got here because we have no jurisdiction over a Catholic school. But bottom line is the church has made a decision and your kids can't come back. The father then had a press conference and he said, I was told that Tobin was a JP, a, a Francis Bishop. Obviously, that's not the case. <laughs> and I think he still wanted to, to, to sue further. Uh, but I mean, it was, it was absolutely outrageous behavior. And again, how the lower court even entertained it. I mean, it should have been thrown out absolutely immediately. But you see how people operate today, huh? And uh, if I don't get what I want, I'll sue the pants off you. <laughs> Um, then let's see what other goodies we have. I mentioned that study about seminarians. Uh, what's that? Saying Father Ryan's going to need another bag going back to. Well, you could have your. Uh, you could have your own plane. You could talk to Trump and he could take your. Uh, the. Uh, I mentioned seminary perspectives on Catholic schools and the new evangelization. This is the whole article. It's very, very well done. Uh, and then, uh, stewards of education, how schools partner with parents. Uh, and we keep emphasizing that. Huh? It's home school cooperation. And, uh, and if the parents aren't there to begin with, we should, our goal ought to be, to, as much as possible, to bring them on, on, on page with us. And then here's a great story about Montessori schools. And as I mentioned the other day, one of the presenters talked about Montessori. That poor lady must be spinning in her grave to see secular versions of Montessori. I mean, it, it absolutely cannot work in the right way if it's divorced from a life of faith. And I understand, by the way, someone has introduced the cause for her canonization better than some of the other ones we've had. Uh, and then a piece on the Protestant origins of a dysfunctional education. So that what we're seeing in mainstream education is really a result of both the Enlightenment and Protestant fundamentalism. And therefore, why we cannot and should not mimic it. Right? All right. Here's the Greeley survey about optimism that I mentioned. Okay, let's actually take a look at this, pass them around, and I'll give out some other stuff in the interim, but that's worth looking at. And here's some data on the least religious generation. And again, my point is that we have to know the data before we know how to respond. And so it's, it's, we're not talking about simply um, being controlled by sociology. But, you know, we're about people, and sociology is about people. Right? Uh, and so we need to know what people are, are thinking or not thinking. Right? Uh, and then we had a little follow-up from our Salesian friends yesterday. Uh, seven saintly tips on how to discipline a child according to Don Bosco. 
schools are pillar of the church in Sudan, right? Uh, I've traveled rather extensively through the Middle East, and I've got to tell you, the number one source of peace in the Middle East is the Catholic school system. Um, about seven, eight years ago, I did a eight-week sort of fact-finding fact trip through Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and Egypt. Actually, we had been invited to do this by double day. We wanted priests, my colleague and I, to go and, and study the thing and write a book about it. And then, of course, everything blew up again in the Middle East. And nobody's interested in reading anything about it anymore. Uh, but we went for eight weeks. Uh, Any time that we had a, a Muslim driver or tour guide who was intelligent and open-minded, they all had one thing in common. They had all gone to Catholic schools. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting, too. I mean, uh, we didn't wear suits there because they think you're a butler or something. Nobody knows what this is. Uh, we were cassock the whole time. Always treated with respect. Sometimes even imams inviting us in to have a cup of tea or something. But the most fascinating experience was in what was then the beautiful town of Aleppo. So magnificent and, and the shambles that that whole thing is now. But it was a Friday and evening, and we were looking for a restaurant. I have two essential criteria for a restaurant. The guys that know me know what that are. Number one, cloth napkins, and number two, booze. And, uh, <laughs> and but this was a Friday, so that was a third criterion fish. And uh, so um, we're looking around and I see this restaurant, and from the front window, I can see through to the back, which is a window, right onto the sea. This looks very nice. So we go in, and the major D sees us, and he goes, oh. And so Father Nicholas looks at me, and he said, do we have to confess to each other? Is this the end? <laughs> and he comes back, and this big, burly guy comes, and he says, in a British accent, uh, Good evening, fathers. Uh, I trust that your Catholic priests, you're most welcome here. Come in. May I take you to a table? He brings us to a lovely table at the window overlooking the sea. And he said, uh, <clears throat> uh, I presume you're looking for fish today. Uh, and I'm sure that you're thirsty. May I get you a drink? This is always a crisis because you're too close to a mosque. You can't get what you want. Uh, and so he said, what would it be? And so we tell him, he brings the drinks. And he said, uh, with your permission, he's the owner, I would like to cook and serve, cook for you and serve you today personally. I said, well, what's all this about? And he said, everything I am is what the Catholic Church of Schools made me. He said, I said, oh, he said, I had the Notre Dame sisters in elementary school, I had the Christian brothers in high school, and I had the Jesuits in college. I thought, well, two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> Although the Jesuits in the Middle East are pretty good. When you're under fire, you, know, you can't get us all the craziness too much. And, uh, <laughs> so he said, uh, uh, I said, oh. Okay. And so as he brought each course, he kept talking more and more. And uh, I said, oh, I noticed that you're, you're married, you have children. He said, yes, I have two boys. He said, uh, my boys are in the same primary school that I went to. I said, oh, how do they like it? He said, they love it. He said, my seventh grader actually wants to become a Catholic. And I said, and how do you feel about that? He said, I think it's wonderful. And I said, what's your love affair with the Catholic Church? He said, Father, every Catholic priest, sister, brother, and lay teacher I had was intelligent and loving and open-minded. And every imam I've ever met was stupid and grasping and corrupt. I said, well, if you have this love affair with the church, why don't you become a Catholic? He said, well, as you Americans say, when the old man goes. So we had a wonderful meal, 
It's now about 10 30, 11 o'clock. And I said, Well, well we need to leave. And, and I'm, I had a check, and he said, Excuse me. After everything I told you, you have, forgive me, Father, <laughs> but the stupidity <laughs> to ask for a check. I am what I am. I own this because of your church. He said, Please don't insult me. He said, However, if you do want to do something in return for the meal, are you in a big rush? And I said, not particularly. He said, the staff is intrigued by having you here tonight. And several of them have questions about Christ and the church. Would you like to sit down when we close up in 15 minutes and chat with them? Oh, my gosh. We were there until 2 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> You're leaving, aren't you? <laughs> uh, but you see, we're just to try that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but we were serious. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, number one, the evangelization evangelization prospects of Catholic education. Number two, of course, you see the importance of being identifiable always. Right? Uh, sometimes bishops will say to me, "You have the most interesting stories." My priests never tell me those stories. Like, well, of course. You know, if your jeans and a t-shirt, who the hell knows who you are, you know? And the missed opportunities cost them. Uh, but at any rate, in the, in, in the Middle East, I, I spent a week in Morocco a couple of years ago speaking at a Muslim university. And uh, and again, the whole time in a cassock. And it's fascinating, in, in former French North Africa, if a priest is around and a certain generation of men see them, bonjour mon père, ça va mon père, because they were taught by priests. Right. Usually the Maris or the uh, what was the other big French order that was up there, uh, but no, none whatsoever. Right? I, I gave a, a talk to future imams on the difference between Catholic and Muslim ideas of revelation. <laughs> I did a talk to their their equivalent of campus ministry on interreligious dialogue in a secularized <laughs> era, and then a mandatory full university lecture on. Uh, uh, the uh, the role of, of theology in a university curriculum, essentially using Newman. Perfect, right? Excellent responses. So again, at times we're not playing our cards right. Interestingly, in, in in North Africa, almost all the Catholic clergy are in lay clothes constantly. Nobody knows who they are. All missed opportunities all across the board. And then if you walk into some of their quote, liturgies, you're in for a real treat. Uh, uh, this is from the SSPX. Uh, I mentioned to you how how they have a commitment to schools, even for their very very tiny parishes. And this is from their newsletter of last year about one of their schools in upstate New York on the uh, here's another one on the Canadian border. All right. This is the uh, original. You want to I know. Uh, yeah, I have it. I have it. It's okay. Thank you. Let's take a look at that Greeley thing uh, about the uh, optimism. And you see the, the four scenarii. You just visited your doctor, and he's told you you're the blessed in year to live. He's also telling you your disease is incurable. Which of the following statements comes close to expressing your reaction? It'll all work out for the best somehow. Well, it's not going to be dead. Uh, no one should question the goodness of God's decision about death. Fatalism. There's nothing I do about, so I'll continue as before. Kind of grit your teeth. I'm angry and bitter at, at, at this twist of fate. I've had a full life and thankful for that. Death is painful, but it's not the end for me. <coughs> and it's the F answer in each. That's the answer that's most frequently given by Catholic school graduates. And it's what he calls the answer of Christian optimism. So it acknowledges that there's a problem. So death is painful. This is tragic. God has sent me a heavy cross, right? For all reality. But, and, and the but is, is the aspect of, of Christian optimism. And, and as I said the other day, in a, a culture and particularly in a generation, of people that are just given to despair constantly. Uh, this is a, a great selling point for any any school. Uh, 
Would you get me that box of books that's on the floor at the back? That's the last phase of show and tell. <laughs> That's a partial intelligence. I mentioned about religion and science. Here's the book, Faith, Science, and Reason, Theology on the Cutting Edge. And it's a junior high freshman book, I would say. Christopher Baglow, uh, he organized for a couple of his summers a conference for the teachers of science and religion at Catholic high schools. And it's limited, it was limited to 50 participants. They both had to come from the same school, a religion teacher and a science teacher from the same school, in order to initiate a conversation between the two departments. And, uh, and this book deals with all of the, the knotty issues where science and religion, religion intersect, or at least should. And by the way, make sure all those come back, otherwise your planes will crash. Uh, this is part of the... Uh, the Catholic School's textbook project, uh, Light to the Nations, History of Christian Civilization. Is that the one you were using? Yeah. And All Ye Lands, World Cultures and Geography. Uh, wonderful books. Uh, the first editions of them were a little problematic with reading level. And they finally got enough sense to get a national Dominican involved who knew how to not dumb it down, but make it more <laughs> age appropriate. Yeah, and uh, and so these are. It was the same problem with the faith and life religion series. It was probably written for ninth graders, and it was geared, and it was supposed to be for sixth graders, right? And by the way, you know, I think, I hope you know, that the average um, college textbook for history or whatever today in this country is geared for what level? Six. That means 12 year olds. That's how stupid they all are. Um, this I alluded to the other day is Public Education Necessary by Samuel Blumenfeld. Uh, he and I were on a panel sponsored by the Connecticut State Commission of Education over 25 years ago. And it was the, the State Commissioner of Education. Uh, Sacred Heart University in Bridgeport, and the two of us, and uh, to talk about this conversation uh, between public and private education. And Blumenfeld had just written the book. And uh, when he, let me see if I can find the last line, because if you don't have time to read the whole book, You know what grade this is? this high school? No, I would say junior high. Right, yeah. you just, uh, so, first of all, as you know, the sacred cow in this country is so called public education. You say anything against it, you, know, you can stomp on a flag or take a knee now. There's no problem with that. But say something about the public schools and you're, you're involved in civil heresy. Uh, and so this man writes a book saying the whole thing is a fraud right? and needs to be closed down. The best part was he's an atheist Jew. So, so I'm there as a, as a Catholic priest, but here's, he's more extreme than I am, if you can imagine. And, uh, and he's saying all this, and the State Commissioner of Education is you know, ready for the intensive care unit at this point. He can't believe this is being said. But here's the last paragraph. <clears throat> the failure of public education is the failure of statism as a political philosophy. It has been tried. It has been found sorely wanting. Having learned from our mistakes, would it not be better to return to the basic principles upon which this nation was founded? Education was not seen then as a cure-all for man's moral diseases, but it was on that premise that the reformers built the present system. They were wrong. The system cannot work because in a free society, here's the critical sentence, in a free society, Government has no more place in education than it has in religion. Once Americans grasp the full significance of this idea, 
They'll understand why the return of educational freedom is essential to the preservation and expansion of American freedom in general. And he makes the point elsewhere that why is this a problem? Because the government does not belong involved in forming men's minds and hearts. That is outside the purview of the role of government. To provide the sources, the resources to do it, that's fine, but not to run the system. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a devastating video of Waiting for Superman. Any of you have seen this? Suburban schools. The suburban schools, all right? Uh, and then this is a, a critique of the so-called Common Core. And it's interesting, I ran a workshop before, before this crazy Common Core came in. I ran a workshop for diocesan superintendents at the Jersey Shore. Uh, we had about, I guess, 40 some diocese set people. And, uh, and the first thing I said about it is, hey, don't get on board yet, right? Let, let the other ones work out the case. Uh, my guess, my attitude was like Gamaliel. Let it play out, see where it goes. Don't waste your energy on it, pro or con. We don't have to get involved, let it see. And of course, it's been an abject failure of everything. Uh, in New York State, that was one of the first to get on board with it. Now they're opposed to it. The teachers Union, public school teachers union is opposed, not for the right reasons. They don't want the accountability that comes with it. The state tests that make them look really bad as teachers, all right? But it's great, you know, that you can have, you know, I don't care if the guy agrees with me on everything or not, but on this one he does. So let, let's get together on it. Uh, the um, New City Press is a publication of the Focolare movement, and they do a lot of good stuff, and they tend to be a little wishy washy on things. And this book has merit, although I think it has some problems. It's called Steps to Healing Polarization in the Classroom. And <clears throat> so obviously, it's something. I think it's important to teach kids from the beginning that it's possible to disagree with somebody without being disagreeable, right? And, and in our climate today, uh, that anytime I disagree with you, I'm a hater, all right? Or, or I should be shut up or shouted down or whatever. And that's the part of the book that's good. The part that concerns me, especially toward the end, is it really suggests that, well, we can live with alternate points of view and live in the sense of almost willing to, if not wink at them, even accept them. So, but the fundamental points, I think, are good. <clears throat> um, this is a very interesting book, uh, which comes from the UK uh, originally. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this one, no, this one is from here. There's another one from the UK. It's called Educating in Christ, a Practical Handbook for Developing the Catholic Faith from Childhood to Adolescence. For parents, teachers, catechists, and school administrators. Extremely well done. Covers every, starts with the whole anthropology, and then psychology of education, et cetera. And therefore, huh, I think that's the problem. We sometimes try to have a program, but it's not grounded in either philosophy, theology, or psychology properly. Uh, uh, this is the one from the UK, from Grace Wing, a companion to Catholic education. And it's about 15 different uh, 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 contributors. Uh, theological knowledge, application to context. Uh, very, very well done. Uh, this is uh, The Risk of Education. It's an English translation of uh, Luigi Gersani's book, um, Il Rischio Educativo, The Educational Risk. Uh, Gersani was an interesting character in a lot of ways. Huh? Uh, and uh, the founder of the Canadian Liberation Movement, huh? as they call them in Italy, the Cialini. And uh, first of all, it seems to me that without the CL movement in Italy, the church would be totally dead. And uh, uh, and Giussani, I think, was ordained in 1953 from Milan. And his first job was a uh, high school teacher. And he tells the story that his first two weeks of teaching religion to these you know, adolescent boys he said, it was clear to me, remember this is 53, that we were not connecting at all. He said, I was presenting formulas, they were writing them back down and so forth. Uh, he said, but there was no impact on their lives. And that's when he starts coming up with this idea about you know, all that vocabulary you hear coming out of Benedict, huh? about friendship and encounter and so forth. That's all Cellini conversation. Huh? 
And this book is excellent. Uh, the Risk of Education, Discovering Our Ultimate Destiny. The only problem is the English translation is horrible. <laughs> uh, and I have a lot of Cellini friends, and I said, I wish you had given this to us and Newman House Press. We could have done a good translation. Uh, they said, well, uh, they used one of their own, I think, uh, an Italian who thought he knew English. And, uh, but, but the content is really, really superb. This is the famous blockbuster book of the 1980s, The Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom, and how higher education has failed democracy and impoverished the souls of today's students. Uh, <clears throat> he was almost drummed out of the whole educational establishment for this. He talks about the moral relativist. He said, the one thing that any professor in an American university can count on is that 95% of his incoming freshmen are moral relativists. That having been said, as you read on, you discover he's a moral relativist, right? But he's diagnosed it correctly. Uh, when I taught educational philosophy here and at St. John's, this was a required textbook. Uh, it really lays out the case. And if that's the case, was the case in what, 1985 or whatever it was, it's exponentially worse today. Um, a book by Ryan Topping by Angelico Press. This is an up and coming press. It's really very interesting, well, well worth considering. Uh, Ryan is a, um, not you, uh, is a Canadian who spent a lot of time working here in the States. The Case for Catholic Education, Why Parents, Teachers, and Politicians Should Reclaim the Principles of Catholic Pedagogy. Uh, and then another one edited by him, Renewing the Mind, A Reader in the Philosophy of Catholic Education. If I were teaching a course today in Catholic education and educational philosophy, this would be the textbook. And the topics, let's see. Part one, the aims of education. And these are readings, huh? So Plato, Aristotle, Quintilian, Augustine, Aquinas, Thomas Akempis, Newman, and John Paul. Uh, or part two, the, main, the matter of learning. Plato, Basil the Great, Hugh of St. Victor, Bonaventure, Aquinas, Newman, Maritain. Methods of teaching, Plato, Augustine, Aquinas, Erasmus, Montaigne, Society of Jesus, uh, Montessori, uh, Circulange. On the renewal of our time, Leo XIII, Chesterton, Knox, Lewis, Sayers, Dawson, Sr., John Paul, uh, Michael Miller, and Benedict. Uh, very, very good, comprehensive. Uh, <clears throat> Education at the Crossroads by Jacques Maritain. Mary Tan gave a series of lectures at Columbia Teachers College. I believe it was 46 or 47. And, uh, and he talked about the abysmal state, his observations of the abysmal state of American education in the 40s. He was ripped to shreds in the American media. Uh, he, he was this stuffy European who didn't understand American democracy, blah, 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 blah. Well, he was absolutely correct. And everything that he said in here, he saw through a philosophical prism, and it's all been true, proven painfully true. And once again, what do we get? Notice the aims of education, concerning the aims of education, the paradoxes of education, the dynamics of education, um, the humanities and liberal education, and the trials of present day education. Uh, these were individual lectures that were then collated into this book. Uh, the Holy See's Teaching on Catholic Schools, uh, a, a work of Archbishop Michael Miller, a uh, Brazilian father from Canada, but who <clears throat> worked in the Secretariat of State in Rome for a number of years, and then came to, uh, to Houston and took over University of St. Thomas, which he completely transformed then got called back to Rome and was made the uh, secretary for the Congregation of Catholic Education, a short-lived uh, appointment for a variety of reasons. And then he ended up back in Canada in Vancouver as the archbishop. But he is the one who came up with this idea of benchmarks of Catholic identity. And, uh, and it's, I think it was actually a talk he gave, I think it was at Catholic U or... Let me see. Right here. What? Right. And, uh, but this is what started the whole conversation going. It's very well done. 
Ah, you remember the first night I alluded to this. Mixed messages, what bishops and priests say about Catholic schools. It's Father Stephen O'Brien from the Diocese of Richmond. Uh, and that's the whole point that they all talk a good storm, but then when push comes to shove, they're the first ones turning out the lights and, and, and uh, shuttering up the windows and doors. Uh, teaching the tradition, Catholic themes in American disciplines, it's really, it's geared to university level, but you get wonderful ideas about how to do the integration of, of, of theology and philosophy into an overall curriculum. Uh, so <clears throat> the topics, uh, foundation. So fundamental Catholic theology, Catholic anthropology. Yeah, we do have a Catholic anthropology. Yeah. What's the real cause of the Protestant Reformation? Nothing to do with indulgences or any of that stuff. It's a view of man, right? <laughs> uh, and perspectives in Catholic theology, philosophy, part two, the Catholic intellectual tradition in the humanities. So poetry and Catholic themes. Uh, I help out frequently at Holy Innocence Church in Manhattan, 37th Street, three blocks north of Macy's. And uh, we have uh, six daily masses there, and uh, only two on Sunday. Uh, there's nobody there on the weekend. Uh, uh, but um, 11 masses on the Holy Day of Obligation. So when people tell you people don't go to mass on the Holy Days, don't tell us that. Okay? Uh, Ash Wednesday, probably another 10 masses. And of course, ashing people all day long. Uh, confessions, three hours a day. Uh, when I hear confessions there, I get them probably in five different languages. Uh, and it's not the locals, it's people who are there on business trips or God knows what. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one mass a day is in the extraordinary form. Uh, all the masses are celebrated at Adorantum at the high altar, you know, Cranmer table. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, actually, I should have done that this morning. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm a great one. I guess it must be in the Slavic blood, but uh, I'm a great one about it. Capitalizing on anniversaries, you know, John Paul never missed an anniversary to use something for it. And uh, and I remembered that it was the hundredth anniversary this year of the death of Joyce Kilmer, the great Catholic poet, the, we, whose poetry we had to memorize in grammar school. The famous poem, poem "Trees." Maybe you know that. I think that I shall never see. The poem is lovely as a tree, right? And uh, uh, and so. He's a convert through Holy Innocence Church. He used to work, imagine, for the New York Times, but would stop into the church and pray and had his conversion experience there. And so I said, well, let's have a solemn requiem mass for him <laughs> and, uh, and have that followed by a lecture on his poetry and Catholic poetry in general. And of course, one of the parishioners said, well, you think after 100 years, he still needs masses? <laughs> and so part of the, what I said in the homily was, well, St. Peter says a thousand days and a hundred, one day and a thousand days, so we don't know. But if, if he didn't need the mass, it can go for somebody else. Uh, but we did something on Catholic poetry. <clears throat> we had about 200 people at the mass, and about 100 of them stayed for the poetry lecture. Delighted with the whole conversation. Huh? And first of all, again, my point, how can you teach poetry without alluding to the religious, moral, philosophical elements of it? Huh? And so, and the woman came up to me afterwards and she said, uh, Father, I've never been in this church before, but I was in Macy's this afternoon and a woman colleague of mine I met somewhere along the line, uh, who knows that she's a writer said, you're a Catholic, aren't you? And she said, yes. And she said, well, you know, the church up the block is having something about some kind of a Catholic poet, you may want to go to that. And she said, and so I came, she said, I love it, this is wonderful. She said, but I think God really wanted me to be here today because I've been feeling guilty that I've been a writer and I'm wondering if this is what God wants me to do with my life, blah, blah, blah. And she said, and you spent a half hour of a, of a lecture talking about the vocation of a Catholic writer. And she said, and you've made me feel not guilty anymore. <laughs> And she said, number one. Number two, I really like the mass that I saw here and you know, kind of put me on a list so I can keep finding out what's going on. But again, another means of evangelization. Huh? Uh, drama in Catholic themes, fiction in Catholic themes, <laughs> political theory in Catholic themes, history in a Catholic framework, mathematics, reality, and God, Catholic themes in art and music, 
psychology in a Catholic framework, evolutionary biology in a Catholic framework, uh, environmental studies. Well, we have a lot of more. Uh, <laughs> uh, physics and astronomy in a Catholic framework, uh, economics and business, education, medicine, health, and, uh, and health, law in a Catholic framework. But as I say, geared to the university, but any intelligent teacher can make the appropriate applications to uh, either elementary or secondary. And then two books by uh, Father Harold Buteau, who taught at Catholic University for decades and sort of the grandpa of uh, Catholic educational history. And uh, the first is called Of Singular Benefit, The Story of U.S. Catholic Education, and then a follow-up book uh, back in the 80s, The Catholic School, Its Roots, Identity, and Future. Uh, again, these are things I think our teachers need to know. Well, you men need to know, huh? Uh, but you can't move forward unless you know where you've been. And, and you can't know, you can't analyze the pleasant problem unless you know where we've been. And if you know where we've been, you want to know with them how we get to the next step. So these books are, as I say, it's not for use in terms of what I can adopt now, but to know where I've been and how to get to the future. So that's the end of show and tell. And then if you'd be kind enough, we'll fill out one of these. It's not a final exam, but. And so while you're doing that, any questions, comments, observations? Yes. Can I ask if you know of any other resources besides the National Catholic Bioethics Center for uh, vaccinations in Catholic school students? No. Okay. Because um, we follow their policy and we're turning away families that are more and more looking to enter, but the diocese says absolutely not. Well, as I said to you at Vespers on Tuesday night, in 1955, you wouldn't have gotten your kid in the Catholic school if it wasn't inoculated. Right. I mean, and uh, recently there was a situation, well, about five, six years ago, in the Trenton Diocese, uh, <clears throat> a community, uh, a school run by a very fine community of sisters, and, you know, a mother came in and she said, I don't want my child vaccinated. And the sister said, well, I'm sorry, I can't put 250 children at risk. Uh, well, I have an objection to it about, you know, fetal things. And I, first of all, I don't know how we can distance ourselves from everything that's problematic today. I mean, we probably wouldn't even be drinking water if we had to figure out the, the etiology of you know, where did it come from and who did what. And we do have a concept in, you know, moral theology of remote cooperation, right? Uh, there's a community of, of cloister nuns that I do things for, and they indicated that they really, you know, they don't eat meat, and that they do like uh, Philadelphia cream cheese. And uh, but we found out, Father, that they contribute to Planned Parenthood. Mother, first of all, stop looking online, okay? <laughs> you know, you don't need to know this, all right? And uh, and what are you going to do? You know, the same thing with you know, who's investing in what. Now, if it's a direct involvement, that's another story. But I mean, eating cream cheese, right? That's, I think it's getting a little too dramatic. Right? Anything else? Yeah. Um, can you address the event incidents at homeschooling? You know, a lot of my parishioners, they do homeschool. Like that. I'm not in favor of it at all. Yeah. And what uh, advice would you give to get them to back in as well? Because in fact, if you look up Catholic homeschooling, Probably about the second or third entry will be my name as public enemy number one. Right? Um, I would say this: if the only other option is a public school, that's a different story. But if there's an existing Catholic school, even a bad one, huh, is better than the alternative. Uh, <clears throat> for the most part, oh, here, here's my theory: uh, Catholicism is an institutional incarnation of religion. And if you have <clears throat> a school that's run by, officially run by the church and you consciously choose not to use it, that's making an anti-institutional statement, which somehow or other gets into the blood, right? Um, now, I understand 
again, we've been talking about this very honestly. I mean, there are Catholic schools that need serious work. But the way to do it is not to abandon the fight. Uh, the way to do it is to say, this has to change. Uh, in Steubenville, I think it's St. Peter's School, is it right? Father Chris? That's a big parish. And I don't know if they have a grammar school. They have closing. Oh, they do. They, it, was a, it was a very good Catholic school, actually. And there was such a substantial number of people who had been contaminated by the disease of Scott Hong's wife. Uh, these women who were convinced this is their vocation, all right? Their vocation is to be a mother, not a teacher. Right? But they were convinced that this was essential to them, that a very fine Catholic school had to close because of no kids going to it, because you had these people doing their own thing. Um, but I have a simple, I mean, how did we get Catholic homeschooling? We got it because of institutional stupidity, right? We caused the circumstances for it to happen. That having been said, many people are in the movement today who don't realize that the Catholic school that they're, they were protesting doesn't exist anymore, right? So I had some people say to me, well, when my brother went to St. Whoever, uh, they had the most horrible sex ed program there imaginable. I said, well, that was 27 years ago. Have you been to the school now? Well, uh, I said, have you been there? No. Well, may I suggest that you go and spend the day and see what's going on now, all right? And, and the interesting thing is the really bad schools, for the most part, are closed, right? Uh, there's no market. That's the one thing about, you know, American capitalism that works, right? Uh, if you're not producing the product, people don't buy it. And so it goes belly up, up belly up. Um, what you know, the Huffs will tell you, again, Rick spoke on, on Tuesday night, the worst that they experienced in three different Catholic schools was something not being said, all right? No objective heresy whatsoever. A woman said to me at one point why she pulled her kid out of the parish school. Um, she said, uh, in second grade, the children, or first grade, the children were told they should come every day with a prayer that they wanted to lead the, the class in. And she said, so it got to be October, and her kid's uh, turn came up. And the little kid gave the guardian angel prayer. And the teacher said, oh, that is lovely. Yes. Now, boys and girls, we should learn that. And she said, and she came in the next day, and she photographed, photocopied it and gave it out. And I said, and? And she said, it's outrageous. I said, what? She said, she should have been teaching that from the beginning of the year. My son had to bring that in. Out. I said, he's a psychiatrist. Right? The teacher didn't say, oh my God, never talk about the guardian angels in here. Well, we don't believe in that. Right? No. It was, oh, this is a wonderful thing. Now let's all learn this prayer. So, I mean, there are people that are just perpetual cranks, you know? And, well, no, I'm sorry, you know? Uh, and, and you find it really in the tragedy movement, all right? And the fringe on the manifold wasn't the right length, you know? So, you've got to find something always. And they wouldn't be happy in heaven. And, uh, and heaven wouldn't be so happy to have that either. You know? uh, so I think you have to, are there legitimate, first of all, and no institution is perfect, right? And, I mean, I worked under a priest principal for a year and a half. That anytime I suggested anything, it was, what's your problem? Don't you appreciate how much good is here? Father, I appreciate all the good that's here, but guess what? Everything can be improved. Everything can be improved. Don't be threatened, right? And I think that's also part of the problem, whether it's the educator, the professional educator, or the pastor saying, touching a sacred cow. Right? We can't change anything. That's absurd. Everything can be improved. But the fact that it can be improved doesn't mean it's bad, necessarily. It just means it could be better. And I think that's the attitude that you have to develop. Uh, and uh, and certainly, um, on the vocation front, the absolutely vast majority of kids still come from, from Catholic schools. Yeah. Uh, when I did the uh, three years in a row, the workshop for the deacons at Dunwoody, the last time there were 37 kids in the class, uh, 34 were the graduates of Catholic high schools. Uh, 
and again, that's just another issue for bishops to say, why aren't you investing in this more? What's you know, what's your problem? And, and in any corporation, if ninety percent of your your workers are coming from one source, you want to be supplying that constantly with with resources. No? Anything else? This is your last opportunity. I think we have your cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I do have blocks. <laughs> I see anything coming up with that North Carolina area code. We've there. added two more. Have you memorized them yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> But when I saw the ones coming from Uber the other day, I said, oh, <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> a couple of things. Number one, please remember to hand in your key. Number two, if a, a couple of you could help uh, Paul and me, uh, A, bring books back to our place and then help us clear up the lounge. And we have to put all this junk back into my chariot. Um, and then uh, those who are coming with us to uh, the cathedral at the dinner, let's say that we meet on the first floor of the dorm at 3:30. Uh, and uh, but don't get your Uber until the line there. And uh, and where's your car parked? In the garage. Oh, across from the seminar. Just pull your car up front when. Oh, you can't do it. That's right. You can't do it. Um, oh, yes, you can. Would you park back? I'll show you where to put it, where my car is. And uh, oh, Bob, you're coming, aren't you? Yes. Can you take a couple of guys in your car? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're, you say Chinese then? Where do you? At the at the front desk. Where, where we get in through prison through the turns. Gotcha. <laughs> and then where are we, way? Huh? Where are we meeting? At, right in the front of the door, where and where we go in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then what's going on the dinner? Is it okay? Are they have the heart reader? Should we get cash? Which might because you gave in there approximately like fifty. Right? It is. It is fifty. It is fifty. Yeah. So if you uh, if you want to uh, uh, either I can you can see. Put it on our PayPal account or or whatever you want to do. Oh, okay. 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 Right, any other housekeeping detail? Well, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for your attention. I hope uh, it's worked in some way. Uh, spread the word. And uh, if I or our Catholic Education Foundation can do anything for you, your diocese, uh, I'm speaking to the uh, the first, imagine the first Catholic School Teachers Convention in the history of the Archdiocese of Detroit. First, uh, uh, on the 14th of August, a couple thousand teachers. And, uh, so, uh, and then also in August, I'm going to England for that <clears throat> Evangelium Conference. Uh, uh, some, uh, damage there. So, uh, but again, uh, it's good having you all. I hope that uh, I can say that there's some truth. And uh, by the way, uh, a point that then Bishop Egan made, not the English Egan, the American Cardinal, when he was auxiliary of New York, the vicar for education, as I mentioned, he called together all the priests, uh, all the teachers. And he said, you know, sometimes uh, we, uh, we put insupportable burdens on ourselves and we have such a high expectation that, uh, that it's unreasonable to fulfill, and then we get frustrated. And he said, I always advise people to read carefully the parable of the uh, sower of the seed. And he said, in all of our schools, passing, passing is usually in the 60 or 70 percent. He said, what does our Lord say passing grade is for the sower of the seed? He said, it's 25 percent. He said, if you're successful with 25 percent, you're successful. And very often the priests and Catholic school teachers get frustrated by saying, I just heard about one of our graduates who apostatized or whatever. That's unfortunate. We pray for that person. But it shouldn't discourage us from saying, well, but in the main, huh, our communal successes are far more than our communal failures, and our individual successes are more than our individual failures. And so to, to maintain that, uh, 
an optimistic, Christian optimistic attitude, not, not Pollyanna, but a uh, uh, spirit of, of genuine optimism about what we're doing. It does work. It does work, uh, particularly what we're working with. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that Ignatius says, right, you know, to pray as hard as long as everything depends on God and work as hard as it all depends upon us. So, well, thanks again, gentlemen. And, uh, <laughs>